So how does the Byzantine general's problem relate to the Bitcoin system? Even though Satoshi Nakamoto didn't refer to the subject in the Bitcoin white paper, he was in fact working on the same problem. His idea emerged from attempts to fix one of the crucial vulnerabilities of distributed networks. Any distributed network is susceptible to attacks in which some participants disproportionately increase their influence in the network. For instance, many have faced denial of service, or DOS attacks, in which a malicious user saturates the network by sending too many requests so that regular users' requests can't be processed. Another example is the Sybil attack, named after the protagonist of a 1973 book about a woman suffering from dissociative identity disorder. This is an attack in a peer-to-peer -peer network where all nodes are equal and none is trusted. Every request is multiplied for several users, so there is no one and only node that must necessarily be trusted. A malicious user can create a number of fake nodes, in essence, fake personalities, while in reality, every personality is the same person. This is where the parallel with dissociative identity disorder comes from. Anyway, all of this results in the following. A victim sends a request, the request gets multiplied and sent to several nodes, but then it turns out that all those nodes are controlled by a malicious user who then returns false information. For instance, he overwrites the Bitcoin wallet address of the victim or redirects the victim to a phishing website. Apart from that, in a distributed network where consensus is reached by a majority of nodes with a vote, for example, a malicious user with enough fake nodes can artificially increase the weight of their vote and can even gain unlimited control over the network. The solution that Nakamoto used in his white paper, in the end, emerged from attempts to solve another case of network vulnerability abuse. We're talking about spam mailing lists. In 1992, Cynthia Dwork and Moni Naur published a paper proposing a new way to combat spam. The idea was to accompany every email with proof that, before sending it, the sender solved a problem, or puzzle, that required some insignificant amount of computing resources. Later, in 1999, this proof is going to be named proof of work. The puzzle had to be designed in such a way that a regular user could solve it on their personal computer in a few seconds. But for a spammer sending millions of emails, it would take several weeks with the same equipment. This mechanism, since it required significant computing resources from a spammer, was expected to put an end to the profitability of spam mailing, since the whole spam business model was based on the fact that the messages cost almost nothing to send. At the same time, the puzzle had to be unique for every message as well as for every specific recipient, so that a malicious user couldn't solve the puzzle once, then use the solution to send multiple messages. Another important requirement for the puzzle was an asymmetry between the amount of computing resources required to solve it and the amount of resources needed to validate the solution. Validation by the recipient should be performed as quickly and easily as possible. Dwork and Naor came up with three puzzles complying with all these conditions and thus opened a whole new area of research. Over time, the proof of work paradigm started attracting more and more attention. For example, it was believed to have the potential to fend off denial of service attacks. If the number of requests to connect significantly increased, the server could turn on a mode that required a puzzle to be solved in order to get computing resources for the request to be processed. It was believed that since puzzles require so much computing resources, it was unfeasible for malicious actors to solve enough of them. It was also suggested that proof of work could be used to validate the integrity of web analytics. It could form the basis of a method to count visits to a website without appealing to a third party like Google Analytics. This solution requires users visiting a website to perform some computations and then send the results to the server when their session ends, thus making it easy to check how much time the user spent on the website. One full process, from computing to sending the results, is counted as a visit. This method establishes the lower limit of visiting time and discounts suspiciously short sessions. This leaves room for a certain amount of fake visits, but not enough to actually influence the overall traffic evaluation. Interestingly, proof of work never ended up being used for spam protection, the purpose that Dwork and Hour originally had in mind. There are two reasons for that. First, it became clear that the protocol was bad at stopping spam. 
Spammers often use botnets, meaning they seize control over a large number of personal computers and organize them into a network. In such a network, the activity of any single computer is indistinguishable from ordinary user activity, but collectively they possess enough computing power to send out enormous amounts of emails. Second, proof of work blocks legitimate mass mailings sent by ordinary users. In the end, spam protection went another way. Now it uses machine learning. In parallel to the academic research of Dwork and Naor, Adam Back, the creator of the Hashcash system, came up with a similar idea. Adam came from the cypherpunks, a group of people ideologically opposed to centralization, all of whom strive to achieve anonymity and personal information security via cryptography. In the beginning, cypherpunks communicated with each other using an anonymous mailing list, and everything escalated from there. Among the members were Julian Assange, creator of WikiLeaks, Bram Cohen, author of BitTorrent, Satoshi Nakamoto himself, and other prominent personas. Back's idea was to use hash functions, or more precisely, finding the particular result of a hash function as a puzzle required to process requests. As we have already mentioned, for all intents and purposes, the result of a hash function can be considered random. This means that if one aims to find the specific hash that complies with some preset condition, the only thing one can do is to try and brute force the hash, and there is no way to speed up this process. In practical terms, it looks like this. A counter, which is a random number, is attributed to the message, and the hash of the resulting data gets computed. This hash is tested against the preset condition, and if it doesn't match, the counter changes and the process repeats. Since the hash depends on the data, it changes along with a counter value. This operation repeats until the sender gets an appropriate hash. For example, in order to find a hash starting with n zeros, two to the n attempts are required on average. For hashes that are 256 bits long, in essence, for 2 to the 256 hashes, there are 2 to the 246 hashes starting with 10 zeros. So the probability that a random hash starts with 10 zeros equals 1 over 2 to the 10th. That means that the mean value for the number of attempts required to find such a hash equals 2 to the 10th. Like Dwork and Naor, in the beginning, Back thought that his mechanism was going to be used for spam protection. However, he went further and positioned Hashcash as a system of remote value transmission. This was based on the simple condition that in order to use some objects as currency, these objects had to be scarce and their value had to be agreed on by everyone. Solving puzzles met both requirements. Complex puzzles make value as scarce as the computation needed to produce it and value is determined by the amount of required computation, which is defined by a mean value. It's important to understand that at that moment, Back did not intend to embed the new mechanism into the real world. On the contrary, the cypherpunks wanted to create their own world that was parallel to the traditional one, a world that would consume the real world over time. Though Hashcash met two key requirements for a digital currency system, resource limitation and equal value, it was missing some other important qualities. First, it didn't solve the problem of double spending, the key problem of all digital currency systems. The problem lies in the fact that, without a central node that can verify transactions, it's hard to make sure that the value contained in a transaction hasn't already been spent. Secondly, Hashcash currency couldn't be transferred from one user to another. But solutions were soon to be suggested.